Living authentically can be a terrifying thing, and for some of us, it can flip your life upside down. Well, we recently sat down with Erin, a transgender athlete who is sharing her transition story with hopes of inspiring others. Here is her remarkable story. To me, my gender is greater than the toys that I play with or the activities that I engage in. Gender transcends all of those things. I mean, it really is my sense of self. I always knew that I was female. I always knew that I was a girl from the beginning. And I don't think there was a time when a light switch flipped on me. I can't like bring it back to a certain time. I just know as I grew up, it was never quite right. But I'd say my earliest feelings of that were slowly came on, you know, six, seven, eight, somewhere in there. I was never able to embrace it. I was a middle child. I had four brothers. We kind of grew up in like the suburbs, so it was always a lot of sports, a lot of, you know, kind of like rough play outside. We all had a great relationship and, and still do. You know, growing up in such like a conservative suburban area that I grew up in, so very much wasn't something that was front and center. I always felt alone and a little bit isolated. Me becoming and being myself was a sure way to, um, you know, be socially isolated. That's a scary thing for a kid. So you really learn to hide yourself. I um, got a job at a local car wash and we dried cars. And I would get, you know, a dollar or two every time I'd finish drying a car. And at the end of the day, I'd have, you know, $100 in cash. And I would get on my bike and I would ride two towns over and um, buy makeup and get some clothes. And it was someplace where I knew I wouldn't be seen. And just experimenting again, I think like a lot of the other girls did with a little bit of makeup and provided, you know, a, a great amount of hope and happiness. But it was always kind of sad because in the end, I also couldn't be found out. You know, I would just throw it out immediately and kind of be like, okay, I can move on now. Um, but, I mean, you can't ever move on from who you are as a person. My narrative and living my non-authentic self and following a life that wasn't mine, that I didn't own, wasn't just detrimental to me, it was detrimental to everyone. <laughs> I had gotten married and unfortunately, um, the woman I married got hurt in this, this whole thing. When I came out to her, she was very non-accepting. I decided that if I was going to be in a relationship and be close and and be married with somebody, they had to know completely who they were with, 100%, um, and I came out. My father, very conservative. I think the day before that, we had gotten into a fight over kind of LGBT rights kind of stuff and, and how that plays out in society. So, but I wanted to do it face to face. We took my dad out and I told him, I flew back from San Diego to Denver, which is a short flight. And when I got home, I had a message from my father on my phone saying, you're my kid and I love you. And now you're my daughter and I love you. And um, this doesn't change anything. You've got my support. I will always be behind you. You tell me what you need. And he's been with me ever since. That was the moment that kind of taught me you can't judge somebody by their politics because they have the right to be the exception to your firm belief of them. It didn't matter that, you know, like how we voted. I think it was more about how, um, you know, love transcends. We shared the incredibly personal transition story of Erin Parisi, but not only is she speaking out about her journey, she's also hoping to make history by becoming the first transgender person to summit the world's seven peaks. She's already climbed four, and she has two more on the schedule for next year. Today, Erin joins us on the panel. Now, Erin, I mean, huge round of applause. Your story is so inspiring and so touching. Thank you for sharing it with us and our viewers. Uh, why the Seven Peaks? Why is that important to you? So for my whole life, I pretty much felt like I had to hide um, and not be who I was and not be seen and not be known. Um, and before, I was always an outdoor athlete and being here in Colorado, love, love the mountains. So I was afraid I'd lose all that. Um, ultimately, when I came out and I had the support of my family and my friends, I decided that um, I really thought it was important to be seen. So to go to the highest point on every continent wow. was kind of where I could go, where there's no more shadows and I could just stand in the light and tell people who I am mm. as myself and not hide. What a metaphor. That is wow. awesome. Hey, my mother was a huge advocate for the LGBTQ and I know there's more letters now after that <laughs> right. um, community from very, very early on. And I was raised being a huge supporter of that community. How has the process in, of acceptance changed? I mean, we saw with your dad. 
Yeah, um, I can say it's still not perfect. Um, I did lose friends, and definitely it's tough to be visible on the internet and in public, mm -hmm. but um, I have so many friends, I was surprised. I, th I thought I was gonna have to push the reset button and start over again. What about in the climbing community? The climbing community is a little bit tougher. That's a wow. very um, gendered community. So um, coming out, I definitely lost some rock climbing friends, but um, you know, there's been so many people that have filled in the space. Um, ultimately, my community's gotten bigger and it's mm -hmm. been amazing um, and it's amazing to hear from people in the climbing community that send me messages and say thank you for doing this or thank you for creating some diversity in, in the sport um, you know we need more and different faces to be in there so there has been a lot of good support Erin there's a lot of people who may be watching right now who aren't able to be their authentic self in some capacity what advice would you have for them moving forward so I think that there's a lot of reasons that people can't be themselves. Um, and sometimes it's a, a matter of safety. Um, and in those cases, I tell people to definitely consider their safety and who they are and the position that they're in and try to ultimately find a place where they can be themselves and be, be comfortable with who they are and find open space where they can be who they are. Um, but in places, you know, for me, it was more about my preconceptions of what the world was going to treat me like when I came out and I had wound up all these expectations of, of what it was gonna be like and I was wrong. So I, I do tell people that are thinking about coming out or send me kind of those anonymous messages saying, I wanna come out, thank you for doing this, but how do I do this? I like to tell them, you'll be surprised. People will surprise you. Give people a chance to surprise you. Um, ultimately, I think, you know, when you're not living out and authentically, um, the world is kind of defining the narrative for you. When you come out and you have a chance to be yourself, it's amazing. You actually get a chance to write your own story and own your narrative. And wow. um, when, you know, I, I encourage people to give the world a chance to embrace their narrative as well. How does our DBL Nation, you said you lost a couple friends, we have a lot of friends out there. Yeah. How do they get involved in your journey? Um, I would love it if they would come find us on Facebook or Instagram. Um, we've got a website, it's Transcending, we spell it without the uh, S, so it's Tran, T-R-A-N-S-E-N-D. D I N G. <laughs> we have the full screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, dot org, and um, you can follow along. We do updates there. You can donate. We're a nonprofit. Um, we're really just pushing for people to, um, not just me, but in other sports and other um, and other outdoor spaces. We're just trying to create safe spaces so You're, they can donate to us in those places. Please um, donate. We're going to continue a conversation with you. I believe in our break, we can talk more about that. You are such an inspiration. Yeah, Thank absolutely. you for joining us. Thank you. I had the biggest smile on my face when I found out we had another athlete coming into the building. I played uh, professional football, uh, played the Giants and the Dolphins. Now I have no problem getting tackled by a 250 pound linebacker, but climbing, scaling, peaking, all that, that's your world. Right. Kind of bring me into your world and, and how that even got started. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I used to use the outdoors kind of as a place to get away and yeah. make friends. Um, and it was always therapeutic for me to be in the outdoors. So ultimately, um, you know, I, I found great space outside and great friends. So it was, it's awesome being here in Colorado and having all that space. Take us through one of your toughest moments where you were like, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this, but you had to push through. Right. We were in uh, Aconcagua in South America and um, it's a 23,000 foot peak almost. Ooh. And um, it's the highest mountain outside of the Himalayas. And basically when you get to about 23,000 feet, it's higher than I've ever been in my life. So it was, we had lost, you know, one out of, or two out of every three climbers on our trip had backed out at that point and had turned around. We had five people left out of the 15 we started with. And just to push yourself through, just one step, one breath, and a pause, time and time again until I hit the peak of that mountain was really- That's um, the athlete in us. That's the athlete yeah, that's where we have to, we have to, uh, we have to see it through, yeah. you know? And like, I, I always use sports as some sort of analogy of life yeah you know and like you were saying people were dropping out it, it could be my entertainment journey that I was trying to be on trying to get to the NFL and you just see people drop out while you just continue to push through and uh, and, and get to that what you guys call the summit right yeah. so when you reach the top what's the first feeling when you get to the top I, it's euphoria it's almost um, you know it's almost anticlimactic because you you've gone through this journey and you've made so many friends and you get to the top and it's it's all rock and ice wow. 
so you say, well, there's just more rock and ice here. It was like the last <laughs> one. <laughs> but it is amazing to know that you got there and to celebrate with these people that you've come together yeah. with. And, and, you know, it was 21 days to get to the top of that mountain. Wow. 18 days. 21 so days? It was, days? Um, yeah, it was, it was, it's just so euphoric. And then you realize that you've got to just climb right back down That's, and get right back out of there. It's just take that <laughs> selfie, take the group picture, and right. it's like pack back up and go and right back and down. start working again in the other direction. So let's talk about your next climb. Yeah. How do you prepare for it, and uh, when and where are you are you climbing and when? Are you? So right now I do high intensity intervals to train, okay. and um, you know I work out in the gym five days a week, and then I spend another day or two outside training, climbing uphill and biking. Um, but as the climb gets closer, it more transitions to an outside climbing okay. experience, okay. and um, the next climb will be Denali here in North America. So. Wow.